Um, as you know, uh, Pamela and I have decided to retire. Um, this has been kind of a bit like a two-year plan. Um, and it was all contingent upon finding the right house. We found the right house, so everything's falling into place. Um, what do I want to leave you with? You, you know, I've done a lot of work with, as you might guess, memory. Um, despite my distaste for bingo, I really like work with memory. <laughs> um, there's a few things that I'm hoping you all remember. Now, I, the comments that I'm putting together that I'm hoping you take with you are mainly because my still, my very strong belief that gets stronger as I do this longer, as I age myself, is that, you know, things like chronic illnesses, like Alzheimer's, chronic pain, diabetes, there are a number of chronic illnesses, and often we don't associate Alzheimer's disease with chronic illness. But what's the objective? Let's make it simple. Let's just talk about something like pain. What's the objective if you have pain, chronic pain? By definition, chronic pain is what? Pain that you can't treat very well. It's always with you, always. What's the objective for everybody as they get older? Have a good life. If you have chronic pain, what's the objective? Have a good life despite the pain. Take advantage of the good days. Try to be resilient for the days that are struggles. So I don't want my comments for those people who've had really sad trajectories um, to be misconstrued as not meaning that there aren't some bumps in the road. But my strong belief, the longer I do this, is that our best protection against things like Alzheimer's is to be proactive. And a lot of times the course isn't quite as bad as our anticipation. It's a very complicated disorder. Um, but it's like a chronic disease. What's the objective, if you have Alzheimer's, for your aging? Have a good life even if you don't remember it. Yeah. And I'm not saying that to be cynical. And that's a struggle. I mean, who wants to go into um, a memory facility? But sometimes that's part of the trajectory that gives everybody a good life. And when I say have a good life with Alzheimer's, I don't mean the person that's forgetful. I mean the person that lives with the person that's forgetful. So these are my best attempt to put some of these comments together. Um, one of the things that I've always liked is this quote from Mark Twain. I'm an old man, and I'm working my way in that direction. And I've known a great many troubles, but most of them never occur. How often I had clients that come in and say, when are they going to get nasty? When are they going to become incontinent? When are they going to not know me? And you know, basically, that doesn't happen to everybody. It's a very tricky this, this, this disorder because you really don't have a nice linear course. Let me make some kind of general comments about Alzheimer's disease that you may have considered. And if you read my articles, you, you probably have read this before. First off, here's the good news with Alzheimer's disease. It unfolds over decades. Why is that good news? It gives you advanced warning. And what does it attack first, typically? Short-term memory. So therefore, compared to some things that can happen, it's something that can empower you if you take control relatively early. The saddest thing for me is I haven't approached enough people so that they don't basically look at their memory and track their memory in a more comfortable way. It's a, a shame for our profession that we haven't made that more doable for people. The first thing that's going to happen, Alzheimer's disease is by definition a memory disorder. You know, it's kind of scary semantically. I've had clients now that do the PET scans with the marker. And they come to see me and they say, I'm terrified. I've been told I have Alzheimer's disease early onset. And their memory is astounding. <laughs> well, you can't have a memory disorder you can't have Alzheimer's disease by definition without a memory disorder. So if you don't have a memory disorder, you don't have Alzheimer's disease. Now you have amyloids, 
That we can say clearly, but that's also kind of tricky. You know, and the problem is we don't empower people, and then people get scared, and then they get early diagnosis of things called early Alzheimer's. And at this point, it's just nonsensical, semantically, clinically, and um, personally. You can't diagnose Alzheimer's disease still by imaging studies. I'm very convinced of that. You can image the brain to find many things that are important, but the problem is Alzheimer's is a problem of practical scope. A brain image can't tell you that. You can have some damage in this part of your brain. The brain doesn't care whether it's Alzheimer's, an ice pick, a stroke, a head injury. It doesn't matter what the damage is. You're probably going to have problems with expressive language. I mean, it's a very tricky thing. And we tend to kind of cluster everybody. Everybody that's kind of like over 80, you have some memory problems, it's Alzheimer's disease, and you're going to get demented. So it's another tricky thing that way. Another misconception about Alzheimer's is whatever the pathology is that we think it is now, not everybody with that pathology gets demented. Not everybody that I've seen in my career of roughly 25 years here, not everybody that's been able to follow over time gets demented despite the fact they have some memory problems. I've seen some couples that are astoundingly resilient and it's just the time after time after time they hold together. Now, there's cases where that doesn't happen, but we really don't understand it very well. And there's people with dementias that don't have Alzheimer's. What is a dementia? It means that whatever is affecting your brain is severe enough that you can't live independently anymore. That's what it really means. It's the attack on independence. I mean, I can get away with a lot of befuddlement. I've done it in my life a couple of times. Go to altitude and get goofy with lack of oxygen. Um, fortunately, that's reversible, but, but it's the same kind of principle. Not everybody with dementia has Alzheimer's. Not everybody with Alzheimer's becomes demented. Amyloid treatments are the rage, and they have been for decades. They don't appear to work. I was very encouraged. I just came across an abstract recently that what they're really doing, instead of the amyloid drugs, the uh, plaques that they're attacking, they have some early stage trials now with things that attack the tau protein. At least it's a different direction because we really still don't understand what the pathology of Alzheimer's is. And it becomes increasingly clear if you look at the research that it's what's called a third variable problem. It's somehow correlated with Alzheimer's disease. But if we had a lot more time, I'd go into some details. It's not causal. So I'm hoping we quit diagnosing people with amyloids as having Alzheimer's because it's just not that simple. What's the most empowering thing we can do? What we do is often do these medical screenings, like the mental state exam. To do what? To see if we may be on the course of getting Alzheimer's disease, which of course is an interesting semantic problem that I won't go into. But What's the thing that you need to do that you can treat if you start developing symptoms that say you're at high risk for Alzheimer's? Short-term memory. So I'm going to talk, as you may have been surprised, given that I talk about it all the time, about short-term memory. And let's start you know, on a more personal level. How many in the room have had a senior moment? <laughs> And why have I had them since I've been 20? They're not new, they're just consistent. And they're scary in the culture of Alzheimer's disease. But what's the good news about senior moments? A real senior moment isn't pathologic. But how do you tell the difference? I'm going to hopefully convince you today that there's a way to know the difference. Now, we live in an interesting world, um, even without the complications of computers and information coming from every which direction and, you know, a library sitting at our, our iPad or our telephones now. 
I mean, it, it's a really different world than I grew up in, at least. Uh, we're kind of confronted all the time with uh, this dilemma that we wake up, <laughs> we face our day. This is a real traffic light in China. <laughs> but it gives you an idea which your brain's always sorting out and somehow most of the time it figures out how to find the green light and avoid the accident on the yellow light because I don't know what the street structure looks like in this intersection. But somehow it's masterful at integrating information. And the brain is kind of a complicated organ. It has, um, what, roughly a billion neurons, a trillion synapses, and over 100 neurotransmitters. Do you really think there's a simple solution to making the brain work effectively? Probably not. All of this in the world we live in today for all of us, whether we have memory disorders or not, says we have information anxiety, as someone once put it from constant overstimulation. And that's if you're not stressed otherwise. And if you're a caregiver or you've got a memory disorder, I guarantee you've got other kinds of stresses. 